welcome to Shots with Soldiers. And Shots is a very simple thing. It's a shot of your favorite drink. It does not have to be alcoholic. To toast a soldier or soldiers that we're going to talk about tonight. And, uh, and the tradition of Shots with a Soldier comes from a life of a soldier. And many times in, in the years past, the centuries past, in fact, in cold and dark and tiresome times, the soldiers would be given a shot of uh, any kind of alcohol available to warm their belly, bellies, to sometimes give them a little extra courage. And, and in particular in World War I, it was renowned because before the soldiers went over the top, usually at dawn or just at first light, they would be given a toddy of rum, a shot to do that, to warm their belly, to give them that courage, to allow them to get over the top and charge into the face of an enemy who was armed with machine guns and had barbed wire in the way and artillery falling and snipers waiting to kill them. And so that shot became pretty important. And as always with soldiers, there'd be the occasional one who wouldn't want to take it. So his buddy or buddies would get multiple shots. And there were probably examples of more than one who went over the top with more than one shot in their belly and perhaps just a little tipsy, but still they went. So shots with soldiers, all you need is a glass for me tonight. This is my shot glass, sadly. And you need whatever uh, drink you're going to drink. And this is mine. It's Wendell Clark, number 17 on the Toronto Maple Leafs, the captain whiskey. I noticed right here he signed it for me, and that's going to be my drink tonight to toast our soldiers. And the soldiers that we're going to toast tonight are that soldiers, is not one. And we're going to toast the fighting Newfoundlanders. And really, what I'm going to tell you is a short story about how Newfoundland won World War One, and they did it at a place called Beaumont Hamel. And really, I, I make light of that, but uh, the story is truly one of valor and heroism, and 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 brother and and father, and brother and brother and father and son and battle buddies who would not leave each other. And it's about a tragedy that occurred to the, the men and boys of our province and to our province as an, in its entirety. Population in those days in 1914, 1915, 1916, a population of, of about just over 200,000 people in the outports and in St. John's itself. When war was declared in the summer of 1914, Newfoundlanders flocked to join the military. They flocked to join the army to fight for king and empire. And that's what the recruiting poster said. Your king needs you, the king and empire, come and defend us. And the first 500 who joined were, became known as the Blue Putties, and they were trying to help fit them with uniforms in St. John's, and they didn't have enough material of, of the drab color to make the putties, the cloth that you wrap around the bottom of your pant leg, to go over your combat boot to keep dust and vermin and, and small animals and that kind of thing out. So they found some cloth that was actually blue, and those first 500 in training wore the putties that were blue rather than drab and showed up very vividly on their uniform and became known as the blue putties. And if you ever listen to Great Big C, that very successful group out of Newfoundland, one of their songs is the blue putties and that's exactly what it is about. The Newfoundlanders, as I said, they flocked to join, uh, to support, to fight for the king and empire and sail off to Europe. And in 1915, uh, they were sent to Gallipoli. They saw some action there, not a tremendous amount, but took losses of about 45 of the regiment who died, many of them from disease, some of them from enemy fire, and then were extracted and sent to Northern France. And in early 1916, they moved into the place around a little village called beaumont Hamel. In Newfoundland, we call it beaumont Hamel. The regiment of about 800, just over 800 soldiers uh, moved into the lines just behind the front trenches and were sent forward to the to the front lines and started digging in, in the third line of trenches back. They dug it in, they dug it in deep. And during the months of April and, and uh, May, they dug that trench so deep it became known as St. John's Road. Uh, it was the third line of trenches back. And finally they were moved up there after doing fighting patrols during the, the months prior to it and reconnaissance, reconnaissance patrols in no man's land to try and determine what exactly the enemy was doing. And, and how they were positioned and whether there were gaps in his wire and could they get through those gaps and get too close with the enemy because the enemy was literally only three to 400 yards away down a slight crest into a little valley known as the Y ravine and then back up for about 100 yards and there were the Germans and they had been dug in now for more than two years in that location and were in thoroughly prepared defensive positions with interlocking machine guns snipers out in no man's land and artillery, which had already been ranged because fighting had been taking place over the previous months, the artillery was ranged on every piece of that valley ground. On the morning of the 1st of July, the Newfoundlanders were ordered to attack by their division commander from the 28th Division, who ordered them to go forward at about 8.30 in the morning. An hour and a half earlier, British battalion had attacked through from the front lines that attacked down that slope, 
and come under heavy fire and sustain heavy losses themselves. And what that attack did was woke up the Germans that more was afoot. This was the first day of the Battle of the Somme and the artillery fire and the units attacking right across the front along the Somme River were absolutely incredible. And in fact, at the end of that day, more than 20,000 people from the British Empire forces had lost their lives. More than 20,000 killed on that one day alone for a gain of some hundreds of meters alone. The Newfoundlanders finally got the word to go at 8.30 and the commanding officer queried the command. He said, are you sure you want us to move forward now? And the answer came back, yes, we don't know what the situation is. We're not sure how far the other battalion has progressed, but you are to advance and to get into the German lines and seize the objectives, which were actually about two kilometers distance. That's the kind of optimism that was present in the division command post that day and in the allied command that two or three kilometers away, they could get the advance, take those positions at relatively light losses. And because of the heavy artillery fire, the belief in those higher command posts was that the Germans would be decimated and really wouldn't put up a fight. They were wrong. At 840, uh, the Newfoundlanders got up of that third line of trenches. They had to walk forward to the first line of trenches to go down the slope to attack the enemy. And as they were walking forward, they were supposed to take what's known as communication trenches. In other words, small trenches that allow you to move from one line of trenches to another, still being under, still without being seen or shot at directly by the enemy. But those trenches now were filled with the bodies and the wounded from the first attack in the morning. So the Newfoundlanders, 801 of them, were forced to advance on the open ground and were immediately seen by the Germans in their defensive positions with their observers out. Artillery fire started to fall right away and they had to move forward about 200 yards, not more, to the forward line of trenches. And as they were doing that, they were already taking losses of five to 10% from that artillery fire and even from the impact of some machine gun fire that was being fired indirectly because they knew where the Newfoundlanders were. They kept going and they got into their own barbed wire entanglements. And when you talk about barbed wire, they were entanglements. You're talking about barbed wire and posts and obstacles to movement that were 100 meters deep. And they had been blasted by artillery. They had been torn back and forth. So it was an incredible obstacle to any movement. And yet there were three to four lanes that had been cut through that barbed wire by the battalion previously. But as they went through those lanes, the Germans got a chance to see where they were and it zeroed their machine guns and it zeroed their snipers and it zeroed their artillery impact right in those lanes. The Newfoundlanders moved through a company at a time, 140 soldiers uh, moved forward in those lanes, all bunched up and they were slaughtered. The artillery, hit, uh, the, the artillery impacted right along that barbed wire obstacle into the mass ranks of the Newfoundlanders. The machine gun fire was targeting the exit from that barbed wire obstacle and as people came out, they were being shot down. The snipers were banging round after round, looking for the officers wearing their binoculars around the neck, which they still did on the first day of the Battle of the Somme and identified themselves as the leaders. And they kept going. Some of the Newfoundlanders got through the, the lanes and the barbed wire and kept going down that slope. A bunch of them got down to the one tree that was standing on the battlefield. And because artillery had been firing there for so long in the fighting over the previous two years, there was one tree that stood out on the battlefield it became used as a landmark when trying to navigate across that land that was so torn up. So, the, so the, the, the shape of the land had lost all meaning related to maps, but that one tree helped people navigate. It also helped the Germans register their guns. And anybody who's ever worked with artillery will understand that when you're firing, if you've got a vertical object, it makes it much easier to understand that your rounds are going past it, short of it, and you can zero in on it. A lot of the Newfoundlanders got wounded, got separated from their buddies. And the one item, the one thing they could see that they recognized was that tree. So they crawled to it and found their buddies who had also crawled through that tree, looking for a point that they knew and then a place to, to, uh, from which they could go to get back up to the trenches because by now the regiment was effectively destroyed. And when they started to crawl back up that slope, a hundred yards or so, to the wire, go back through those. Good. Uh, it was absolutely incredible. Because during the orders the day prior, the division commander had ordered that all the soldiers attacking could make a little tin triangle in the biscuit can and put on the back of their uh, of their small back.
So the division commander ordered everybody to have those tin triangles cut out of the biscuit cans, six inches by six inches by six inches, stuck on the back of their small pack. That's where they carried their ammo and their rations and, and things of that nature. And the idea was that when they got to their objectives, the spotter planes overhead would see them, see the sunlight reflecting off those tin triangles, be able to fly over division headquarters and drop a message and the division command post therefore would know that the objective had been reached. Now they had been attacking east at 8.30 in the morning. Now they were retreating up a slope on their bellies, many of them wounded, all of them desperately trying to get back through that wire after coming up the slope to the safety of the trenches and they were now going west. It was a bright and sunny morning and the sun reflected off those tin triangles perfectly and they became the perfect aiming mark for snipers, for machine gunners, and for the artillery observers who were trying to kill those who, who were left. Very few of the soldiers got as far as the German wire. None got into the German lines and very few got back. As they crawled back, those few wounded, uh, they were counted and, and the next day, 68 of them reported for battle. Most of that 68 out of the 801 were those who had been ordered to be left out of battle. And, and left out of battle is a term we still use where some of the leadership at every rank level is held back in case a disaster uh, affects the unit and you can rebuild it around that leadership. Most of that 68 the next morning who showed up for roll call were those who had been left out of battle. On that day, in 45 minutes, 801 with Newfoundlanders went over the top and only 68 came back. Uh, we lost the leadership of our province for the next 50 years. In that first 500, they were the sons of the leading businessmen and government officials, the leaders of Newfoundland then, and that generation would have been the leadership of Newfoundland for the next generation. They would have led for the next 50 years. And on that morning when they all died, we lost that leadership in 1919 in the influenza epidemic, when the cod fishery failed, when we had the Great Depression, when Newfoundland went bankrupt in 1937, and when we had to turn control of our province over to the British government uh, and surrender the democracy that we had, and even up to the time when we lured the rest of Canada to join us in Confederation in 1949, our province was impacted by the lack of that leadership. On that morning, it was a terrible tragedy. Fathers died with their sons. Brothers died with brothers. Battle buddies died with battle buddies because they refused to abandon each other. There's still almost 300 bodies of those Newfoundlanders out in no man's land at the, battle, uh, at the battlefield of Beaumont Hamill. There's a beautiful caribou, the first one that was made a, a monument to the Newfoundlanders that's installed there. And it's in pointing in the direction that the regiment was advancing. And in the front of it is a, is a, a plate with all the names of those soldiers whose remains are still missing. And we know they're gone, but we don't know where, where their bodies were. When that message came back to Newfoundland, every single community was impacted in a way that was incredible. I'll just give you one little story of a guy named Wilbur White. He lived in, he came from Comfort Cove, Newfoundland which is right next to, to my home community of Camelton, Newfoundland. Wilbur served with the regiment from the very first day. He went to St. John's and joined as quick as he could, sailed with the regiment to, uh, to England and then on to Gallipoli and then, then back to France. And in April, late April of 1916, while they were in the rear trenches and digging those trenches, he was out on a, a fighting patrol uh, with a platoon and one of his platoon mates was Cole. So Wilbur White took his jacket off with his name tag on and gave it to him. And they got hit by artillery fire and, and his buddy was killed. Wilbur White was knocked unconscious and remained unconscious for about 10 days. He got rescued and evacuated to a field hospital, but nobody knew who he was. But they saw the, his buddy who had been killed and they identified him by the jacket that he had on. So his parents got a, got a telegram saying, you know, regret to inform you that your son Wilbur White has, got, has been killed in action. Two weeks later, Wilbur White in the field hospital wakes up and identifies himself. The error is corrected and his family in Comfort Go get another telegram saying, great news, your son Wilbur White uh, is, is alive, was wounded, but now is returned to action. On the 1st of July, Wilbur White was killed at Beaumont Hamill and his family about a week later got a telegram saying, regret to inform you, to inform you that your son Wilbur White was killed in action on the 1st of July, 1916. Now, can you imagine the grief of that family? And can you perhaps imagine the disbelief that they would have had that another clerical error had taken place 
and that they would soon get a second telegram saying that their son had lived. Examples and tragedies like that abound throughout Newfoundland. Every single family in every community uh, was touched by the horrible tragedy uh, of the loss of so many of our fine sons. In Newfoundland, the 1st of July is Canada Day. Yes, it is. Well, we start in the morning, we call it Commemoration Day or Memorial Day, and we remember all of those Newfoundlanders who gave their lives for us, who served and sacrificed, who did not let their battle buddies down, and despite the fact that they were walking into death, almost absolute, almost certain death, they kept going. There's a video, an old grainy video of the attack for just a few seconds, and one of the things it shows is the soldiers advancing with their chins tucked down into their shoulder, into their chest. Almost as somebody said in Newfoundland, as if they were advancing into a Newfoundland gale with snow and ice coming at them. And they were doing that because it was a snow, it was not snow and ice coming at them. It, it, it was bullets and it was lead and it was artillery explosions. The danger tree still exists at Beaumont Hamill. A hundred and a hundred and something years, what's that now? 104 years later, the danger tree is still there. It's still a pilgrimage for Newfoundlanders. And, and there is not a Newfoundlander, I don't believe who is you know, of adult age, who does not know the story of Beaumont Hamill and what happened there uh, to our sons, and, to our sons and, and what happened to the Newfoundland Regiment there. So tonight when we do a shot, whatever it is, uh, let's do it to the Newfoundlanders. Let's do it to their courage and to their loyalty, to their battle buddies, their loyalty to their blood brothers and to their service and sacrifice of, of all of them, we remember to the Newfoundlanders. 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 So Bruce, I'd take some questions if we had any. I have a question, sir. Yes, please. Sir, I was wondering if you might be able to explain the significance of the monument that they put up for, for the regiment, as well as uh, I believe there were talks about a new monument as well and what you might have known about that. Yeah, there are, there are five monuments up. And plus the one in, uh, there are five monuments, including the one in St. John's, Newfoundland, and the one, and they are the caribou. And the caribou is the is the iconic animal of Newfoundland and Labrador. And there used to be massive herds of them. Now they're just herds, and they grow smaller every year, sadly. But it is the caribou, and it's a full size caribou, and it's beautifully done. The one in St. John's points directly at Beaumont Hamill, and the one in Beaumont Hamill points directly at the one in uh, the, the direction of advance that the regiment was going to take. There are four more, there are three more scattered around uh, France and Belgium for the battles, that, including at Montreal Le Preux, which was fought just after uh, the Canadians took Vimy Ridge, very close to Vimy Ridge. Uh, and and uh, that was on the 14th of April, 1917. There's, and there's one other in France and one other in Belgium. The, the other caribou that's being talked about now that the regiment and Newfoundland would like to do uh, and, and have made and installed as a memorial is at Gallipoli. And there is a program raised, which is slowly getting traction to actually do that, to raise the money, to have the memorial made, and obviously then to uh, have it in place at Gallipoli. So we remember the regiment that fought there and those 45, I believe the number was, that did not come back from Gallipoli, but so many who served there and served there uh, for us. And so that is the extra monument and it is the caribou. And if you've ever seen the one at Beaumont Hamill or any of the others or the one in St. John's, Newfoundland, it's in Bowering Park, they're absolutely beautiful. And it really is, it really is uh, emotional when you look at it and realize what the one at Beaumont Hamill is looking out over. It's looking out over the battlefield where almost 300 of our sons' bodies still lie. Uh, we were there uh, in, in uh, 2017 at Beaumont Hamill. I think that was the last time. And Parks Canada runs Beaumont Hamill along with Vimy, Vimy Park, of course. And they had these incredible young guys. And we had a guy who was from Newfoundland. And oh my goodness, she was good. She spoke at a thousand miles a second, of course, and she had that beautiful lilt, which comes from our province. And she was so proud to be there. And as she talked about the battle and what had happened, she mentioned that her great uncle was out in no man's land and his body had never been found. So can you imagine what an incredible connection huh? she would have had to that battlefield and to what occurred there all those years later. Uh, the, the Caribou Monument and Memorial is absolutely beautiful. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? General, is sure. there any um, ongoing connection today with the Anzacs from Gallipoli between them and the Newfoundland Regiment? I'd love to say yes, David, but I don't believe there is. I, I don't believe there is. And, and the Newfoundland Regiment, I think, kind of moved somewhat away from that. 
Now, I could be mistaken, but if there is connection with the Anzacs because of the fighting at Gallipoli, uh, then it would be uh, it would be very low level. The, the Newfoundlanders fought with the 28th Division, uh, 28th Division and the 88th Brigade, and they fought with that division and brigade throughout most of the war. Uh, not all, but most of it. And so they would have been encompassed in a whole uh, slew of British battalions, obviously, rather than working directly with the uh, Australians or New Zealanders at, at Gallipoli. So I think that would explain probably a large part of it. Okay. Anything else? Well, you are an easy crowd. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that, that concludes tonight's episode. Uh, thank you guys for coming on. Uh, please like and share this, these videos and please feel, feel free to tell your friends about us. Uh, Shots with soldiers.